Um, I'll let you in on a little secret. Um, when I first started preaching at Hill Country Bible Church back in the day, I would be all the way through the introduction of my sermon before I actually realized there were people in the room that was so dialed in to what I was trying to communicate that I would just miss the connection altogether. And so I started a routine that I do before every time before I preach, and it looks like this. to be able to recognize and focus on the reality that this is a transactional conversation and there are three parties in the conversation. There's the person who's speaking, there are the people who are listening and responding, and then there's the Spirit of God who's actually moving. And so that little kind of thing got me focused on speaking so much so that uh, my staff has teased me about that by mocking me in this. And so we came up with that bumper video that takes place at the beginning so I can get all that done in the dark before you actually see it. <laughs> I want to say thank you to Tim and Wendy Cool and to our elders and our staff and for all of you who've made this week such a special week. Uh, we kicked it off on Tuesday with a special lunch with the staff and that was so encouraging to Cindy and I. And then on Thursday night, we had all the city leaders and pastors together and we had a big celebration of all that God's been doing in greater Austin over the past 35 years. And now today we get to actually kind of celebrate as a church family. And it's just been so encouraging to me and to Cindy and I for, for all of your love and all of your faithfulness and all that you poured into us. We just feel overwhelmed with gratitude and so thank you so much for that and it's so hard to imagine that years ago a small group of people sat down and prayed about starting a church in what then was far northwest Austin in other words that was back in the day when people still called the people in Cedar Park the Cedar Choppers and the people in Leander, the Leanderthals, <laughs> like barely electricity out in that part of town. And this group of families got together and started praying and they started Hill Country Bible Church. And over the years, God has used their faithfulness and prayers to do incredible things. We've seen our church grow and expand and plant other churches, over 41 churches in greater Austin itself. We've seen Hill Country Christian School formed and growing today, which has literally educated thousands of, of kids in a Christ-centered, really powerful education. We've also seen the, the city movement to bring the pastors and leaders of our city together for the good news of the gospel, and then that expand throughout our nation, 100 churches in, or cities in our nation and beyond, and, and now and to the ends of the earth in uh, incredible movements that we don't have time to talk about, but all of that started with just a small group of people who had some faith and prayed. And so in March, actually uh, March 5th of 1989, two 29-year-olds with a one-year-old and one on the way pulled our minivan in the parking lot of the church behind the Dairy Queen which is what we were known as because if you're at the Lakeline location right across 620, there's a Dairy Queen and behind the Dairy Queen, actually, I don't even know if it's still there anymore. Who eats Dairy Queen anymore? <laughs> Thank you. I'm so glad some of you have kept the faith in Texas, right? Um, but that little red brick shopping center is where we were meeting and there, I preached a sermon from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. It was actually a sermon that I preached before I became the pastor of Hill Country Bible Church. And I just want to share that same sermon 
today, kind of like 35 years ago I preached that sermon, I want to preach it again today as my farewell sermon. And so if you'll open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12 or grab your smart devices and go to a Bible app and open it to Hebrews chapter 12, we're going to look at three verses today. And in honor of God's word, Hill Country Bible Church, we are people of the book, I want you to stand together as I read this passage. So let's stand in honor of God's word. The writer of Hebrews writes, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. May God bless his word to us as we look at it today. You may be seated. The context of this book is profound because the context of this book comes at a time where a group of people are facing extreme persecution. These are Jewish Christians, thus the name Hebrews, Jewish people that had put their faith in Jesus. And at that time, the Roman Empire was persecuting Christians, but not Jewish people. And so they were questioning, should we just kind of walk away from our relationship with Jesus? Do we move back and simply just embrace our Judaism, let the, 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 the Christianity part go, let the Jesus part go, be safe again? And the writer of the Hebrews is challenging them, don't do that. And the reason why the writer of the Hebrews is challenging them not to do that is because it's worth it. Not only is it worth it to be a follower of Jesus no matter what happens to you, but the other aspect is this was the moment in history where Christianity was expanding in the first century. Literally, the gospel was starting to go out and the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection was being proclaimed and people were coming to faith. And as they were coming to faith, this was not the moment for people to get scared and pull back because the course of history changed with their faithfulness to keep pressing forward. Most of us are poor when it comes to understanding the actual state of the world throughout history. But the Roman Empire that was in charge at that time was very similar to all the other great empires of the world. It was drunk on glory, filled with violence, suppressing the nations was normal, enslaving people was considered morally good, forgiveness, mercy, weakness, spit on that, power and glory. That's the Roman Empire. And Jesus Christ comes into that, gives his life as a sacrifice, says every human is worth it. God loves every human. And his followers, by embracing that message in the midst of pain and suffering, brought to the world a message that literally changed history. Where today, you can't imagine a world where you being made a slave would have been considered normal. In fact, 50% of the world at the time was actually a slave to someone else. And as the message of Jesus began to spread, as the Christians went out into the streets and picked up the sick and dying and cared for them, because in that culture, if you were sick and dying, throwing you to the to the streets was normal. Children, birth control was literally taking the children to the dump if you didn't want a child or if a child was sick or hurting. And they built orphanages and Christians built hospitals and they built places of care. They they began to 
educate people and build what became schools and then universities. And they, they changed the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the people of Jesus have changed the world. Everything you benefit from today did not exist before Jesus came on the planet. And most people that don't even follow Jesus, like don't even follow Jesus, have no idea how much they benefit from that message of God's love and forgiveness and the value of each person, every human life precious, that all came from one source. That came from Jesus Christ. What would have happened if the Hebrews would have decided, we're not going to do this anymore. We're going to bail out. What would have happened to the world? You see, I feel like that what they were experiencing in a really big way in this passage that we're looking at um, like we're starting to see some interesting things happen in our world today. And when I think about where I was 35 years ago in the state of Christianity in the United States 35 years ago and where it is today, I have three observations for you. This is what I'm seeing. The first one is this. The persecution is never so great. I mean, being a Christian in today's culture is looked down upon by many people. And if you don't feel that, just ask a high school student or a college student. People have forgotten what Christianity brought to this world. Secondly, the commitment of Christians is never so low. I mean, today we are way more interested in getting a raise, getting our kids into some college, way more interested in our entertainment. I mean, I, I know this because I hear it from people. Like, I, I've got too much to do. I've got a busy life. I've got to move things forward. I've got things to do and places to visit. Like, it's never been as low. Last one is the stakes for the church in America are never so high. Right now, I believe that if we continue on the same course that we're on today, your grandkids and your great grandkids will live in a world that's post Christian, will be almost no vestiges of Jesus Christ in our world today. That doesn't mean he isn't in the world because Christianity is exploding in Asia, it's exploding in South America, it's exploding in Africa, it's blowing up all over the world. And it's changing those cultures and those people and those places in positive ways. But here, I actually believe that if we don't get serious about being followers of Jesus, I think we're moving in a direction that's going to be hard to recover from. And I just want to say to y'all who believe that there's a political solution to this, that if you believe that a political party can change the hearts of people and turn people into followers and worshipers of Jesus through some kind of legislation, I don't know what to say to you. If you actually believe that a president is more powerful than the God of the universe and you're banking on that, like, I don't know what to do with that. We've been called to a serious devotion to our Christian faith. So, like, what does a serious Christian look like? What does a serious Christian life look like? Are you, are you a serious Christian? Are you living a serious Christian life? Well, let's dive in to this passage. And as we dive into this passage, I, I want to unpack this for you today. In chapter, one, chapter 12, verse 1, the writer of Hebrews writes, Therefore, since we've been surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, get in your mind a stadium. Great cloud of witnesses, let us throw aside everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. In other words, what the author is pointing to here is that the serious Christian life is like a glorious marathon. It's like a glorious marathon. He's actually using the imagery of the Greek games that became the Olympics because as crazy as we are about sports, and like, we're crazy about sports, right? 
And, and if some of you aren't crazy about, enough about sports, then we found a way to kind of merge, like Taylor Swift and, you know, a, a football player together so everybody now can all be crazy about sports, right? We got something to all rally around. I'm still wondering if that's a publicity stunt or not. You say, oh, it's true love. <laughs> true love has sold a lot of records for a very intelligent woman <laughs> who knows that we'll always buy that story of true love for a moment. Anyway, <laughs> that's all I got to say that's culturally irrelevant. <laughs> Why the fixation on sports? Because I actually think that sports, like a race, is a metaphor for life. And we're constantly wanting something to kind of help us with life a little bit. I mean, think about it. Sports has a start and it has an end, a beginning and a finish line. Life does too. We're born into the world and we die, beginning and end. In addition to that, that we know that in sports, those people who discipline themselves and set priorities and are serious about the way they go at it, those are the people who do best in athletics. They're the best runners. How many of you are marathon runners here? Not very many in this crew. <laughs> Steiner Ranch, Leander. How many of you would be marathon joggers? There's a difference between the two, right? A difference between the two. The ones who win are the ones who train, okay? And we know that's true of life. People that take life seriously and discipline themselves in life, they do better. And we also know that there's a scoreboard and at the end of a race, we see the names of the winners and we don't see the names of the losers. Why? Because in life, it's the same way, right? Like everybody sees those who live well and people that don't disappear into the woodwork. That's the metaphor of sports. That's the metaphor of life. And so the writer of Hebrews talks about the Christian life is like this glorious marathon. We give our life to, we start, we finish in the middle. We have challenges that we deal with. But at the end, in the presence of God, those who finish well receive well done. We see the glory in that. And so what does that look like? Well, let's dive in here and we'll unpack this passage quickly. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, you say, who are the witnesses that are surrounding us? Well, if you drop back into chapter 11, chapter 11 is filled with all of these examples of all these people that lived well. Now, they're not simply in the stands cheering you on, as some might say. They're actually the winners who are there to represent, look, model my life. You can do this too. It can be done. Since there's a lot of people that have lived this life well, he goes on to say, here's how you do it. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. Now, if you're a runner, you know that if you're carrying weight, literally that's the word hinder there in the passage, it's get rid of all the weight that you're carrying, or if you've got clothes that tangle up your feet, weight slows you down, clothes that tangle up your feet actually take you out of the race, he uses these images. And here's what he's saying. If you want to live life well, you're going to have to get rid of some things. You've got to get rid of some things, which is kind of obvious in a race, but oftentimes not as obvious in life. But anybody that's truly going to be successful understands the ability to prioritize and say no to the things that do not advance the life you've been called to live, advance the work of God in your life. Anybody that doesn't understand that gets caught up in the, there's so much. I don't know where to start. And the busyness of life takes your focus away. And so there are some things you have to say no to. I mean, literally have to say no to. Some good things that you have to say no to. I'm not going to do these things anymore because they're going to keep me from following Jesus and living the life that I want to live. 
In other words, this lie that's been sown into all of us, that you can have it all. You can get everything. You can do everything, which has created this weird FOMO deal that everybody's worried about missing out. So we try to cram everything in. Where does that come from? That comes from a breadth of advertisers that want you to buy their stuff. They want you to buy the dream home. They want you to buy the vacation home. They want you to feel bad about yourself if you can't post pictures of yourself on a vacation at a special beach someplace. They want you to change your wardrobe and your kitchen every three or four weeks. <laughs> the kitchen doesn't work so well because you get told that it'll take a month to fix this and six months later, you're still washing pans with the outside hose. <laughs> I mean, like, where does all this come from that you can do everything? You can be intellectual, you can be athletic. You can be attractive, you can be funny, you can be everything. No, you really can't. You really can't. You've got to prioritize. And then there's this thing called sin that feels like freedom. I can do whatever I want to do, but all of a sudden it becomes an addiction, and then I'm really messed up. Folks, over the course of our lives, Cindy and I have had to prioritize. We've had to say no to a bunch of stuff. I remember early on, as my kids were coming into the world and starting to come up, four kids, things like hobbies, golf, hunting. Just have to pick the two that took the most time, right? Like I stopped playing. I stopped going because I had other priorities. I want to be with my family. Like I wanted to invest in the kingdom. I want to spend more time with you, and I want to spend more time with people in the city and beyond. When it came to money, we gave away our kids' college fund three times because God was calling us to invest in things. We paid off our house and then sold it and gave all the proceeds that we made from our house to invest in expanding the kingdom, both through Hill Country Bible Church and around the world. Like, those were decisions that we were making along the way because we were saying no to some things so we could say yes to some other things. That, that doesn't make me special. That just makes me serious about my faith. What have you said no to that's a distraction that's keeping you from being able to fully say yes to Jesus? I mean, people tell me all the time, well, I can't. I'm getting an MBA right now, or I'm trying to get my kid into this college, or like, we just need some time away to be together, or like, just all kinds of things we say. But it comes down to, let us throw off the weight. Let us throw off the sin. And then he says this, he says, having gotten rid of those things that slow us down, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And two things I want you to see here. First of all, the word race here is the Greek word agona, from which we get our word agonize. In other words, the race is going to be hard and that's why we run with perseverance. All of you marathoners or joggers that didn't make it, turned into half marathoners along the way, you know, and that's the way life is, purposeful life that's focused on something more than just fitting in with the culture. That actually requires perseverance. And when he says that, he also says something else that I think is just really important. He calls the race, the race marked out for you. Now think about that. That implies that the God creator of the universe who loves you so much, who created you, gave you life, and also gave you your gifts, placed you here in this place at this time, has a purpose, a plan, a course for your life to run. It's unique from mine. 
It's unique from the people around you. It's a special course that God designed for you to live your life, to make an eternal impact for him. And once that sinks in, it liberates you from the need to be like everyone else. Why would we fall into the trap of just following the crowd? Anybody ever go to one of those trail rides on vacation in Colorado where you get on the horse? And that horse is following the horse in front of him and the one following the horse in front of him. And like I think about the poor horse, like the smell isn't very good. The view isn't very good. But everybody's going this way. I think for many of us, our lives, they don't smell too good. The view's pretty ugly. I'm pushed beyond my capacity. I'm running in circles. I'm doing things that everybody tells me I should do, and they're not bringing any satisfaction. I know I'm not making a difference, but I'm just doing what everybody else does. But once you understand that you've been given a unique race to run, a unique difference to make, you've got a masterpiece mission to follow. Suddenly, now, you have the freedom to begin to say no to things that are not part of that mission. Now, let me just warn you. In the American way of doing things, we engineer our lives by thinking, well, if I've got a race that I'm supposed to run, I need to spend a lot of time trying to figure out what that race is. And so I'm going to sit on the sidelines while I'm trying to figure this out. You don't have to do that. In fact, the way of Jesus is simply to do this. Like, I'm going to live my life. I'm going to look for what God's doing, and I'm going to listen as he tells me and guides me. And then I'm going to obey what he says, even if it's kind of crazy. You see, I happen to believe that there are a bunch of you that are listening right now that have been called to plant churches in Austin. I believe that's true. You say, well, I, how can I do that? I'm, I'm like a programmer. No, you're not. You're a child of God. You're a son or a daughter of the king. You know what? You can use that skill to build your website for your new church. Some of you are called to plant churches, and, and some of you know that. Like, you actually know that. God's already told you. Some of you are thinking, I wonder if God wants me to do that. Some of you are called to be missionaries. I mean, you love international travel, right? Like, we travel all over the world. If you want to see the world, God's calling you to be a missionary. Some of you are called to step into spaces where there's pain and suffering and hurting and it bothers you. You wake up thinking about it in the morning or you go to bed thinking about it at nighttime and then the crush of all the busyness of your life crowds it out. And that's been going on for a long time. And in your heart of hearts, you know, God's calling you to something. Maybe it's mentoring the next generation discipling. Maybe it's starting something. Maybe it's joining something that's already been started. I believe that every single one of us has something that God has called us to, a way of life. And when we get serious about God's part in that, it changes everything. Well, that seems great. How do I do this? Well, he tells us in verse 2. He says, the serious Christian life is actually singularly focused on Jesus. Now watch what he says, because this is strong. He says this, he says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. In other words, we need to have a singular focus that our eyes are fixed on Jesus. Now I learned what this means when my grandfather, who was teaching me how to drive a tractor pulling a plow, explained to me that there's no secret to this. It's very singular. If you don't plow the first furrow straight, by the time you get to the edge of the field, you got a mess. So he put me on his lap on the tractor drove me to the side of the field and said, see that tree over there? 
Yeah, Grandpa, it's pretty easy to see. It's the only tree on the end of the field. That tree right there? He says, what I want you to do is hold on to the wheel of the tractor and don't take your eyes off that tree. Why? Squirrel. <laughs> Whatever we focus on is where we go. If you feel like your life is ADD, could it be that, like, this device, scrolling, scrolling, scroll, like, no wonder I'm all over the place. Fix our eyes on Jesus, because if you look at Jesus, you're going to follow him. And he doesn't just mean that some picture of Jesus or icon of Jesus or image in our mind is what we need to look at. He's talking about how Jesus lived his life. Look at how he says it. He says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Now, those two words are important because the author of our faith, literally the trailblazer, or the one who started to live the faith out, is also the finisher, the one who completed the Christian life. And so if you want to know a model of how to live... Open your Bibles to the Gospels. Read about Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then begin to do what he did. Listen to the Father and obey. Take risks when God calls you to trust God, to love and to forgive and to keep pressing forward toward the noble things. When you're looking at Jesus and how he lived his life and you're looking at it in the word of God, it tells you how to live your life. You begin to draw an understanding of how to live your life. And then the author highlights two things about Jesus and the way he lived that are so strong. Look at what he says here. He says, who, Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. God's going to call us to hard things. And the serious Christian's got to be facing those hard things. How did Jesus do that? The joy. Like Jesus knew that as he was walking toward Jerusalem where they would take him and crucify him, he knew that his death would actually provide forgiveness and salvation to all of us. And the motivation of why he endured the hardship and pressed forward was all about how awesome it would be in the reunion in eternity of literally billions of people being part of his eternal kingdom, having experienced him. If you understand how God is using you and the joy of what comes out of that, it keeps you moving forward. But Jesus also did something else. He said, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross shaming the shame, literally two Hebrew words, shaming, uh, shaming, I mean Greek word, shaming the shame. Like, what, what does that mean? Well, what Jesus was facing in the cross was shame because the Romans had perfected a kind of punishment that led to death that was so humiliating that everybody was afraid of it. To literally be nailed to a cross, naked, on the public streets, and to suffer for hours and sometimes days on end, the most excruciating death was reserved in the Roman Empire for slaves. In fact, the way you keep half of your population enslaved, which is what the Romans learned, is every time someone rebels or there's an insurrection, you just kill off a couple thousand of them in the worst way possible. And what that does is that creates a fear. So the Romans made the cross something that was the most shameful, and the Jews believed that anybody who was crucified was cursed by God. And because of that, when Jesus is going to the cross, he knows he's going to shame. But what did Jesus do? He turned the tables on the cross because what he did in his suffering and his death was to provide forgiveness for all. So in our day today, we don't look at the cross 
as an object of shame. We adorn our churches with it. We wear the cross around our neck. Many of you have tattoos of the cross on your body because Jesus took the shame of the cross and turned it into glory by stepping into the hardship and reversing the meaning of it. And that's what we're called to do whenever we face the scorn or the criticism because we're not just doing what everybody else does. We are actually changing things. Forgiveness moves from I'm a victim, I'm broken, I'm on the sidelines, to I forgive you and I am a victor. And I can build on the brokenness of my life to change the lives of others and to give them hope. Literally taking the shame of life and turning it into the glory of transformation. Jesus finished that and he sat down at the right hand of God. In heaven, approved by God and watching his people pick up the Christian life and live it out. Now he ends with verse 3. He says, consider him. The word consider in the Greek there is a calculated word. In other words, as you live your life each and every day, he's saying count the cost. Think about it. Calculate it out. What is really worthwhile in life? Is this activity that I'm doing? Is this goal that I have? Is this really worth it? So consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart taking stock of your life, looking at Jesus, recognizing that there is a day when each and every one of us will actually stand in the presence of God. You are going to stand in the presence of the Creator. And on that day, you're going to see and experience glory that you could never have imagined. And what that means is all the things that seemed important, that 15 minutes of fame on this planet, that is going to go out the window. And what will remain are the eternal things that you did, that you invested in, the people you loved, the gospel you shared those that you helped. And I just want you to know, having been your pastor for 35 years, my prayer for each one of you is that you would hear, well done, that you ran the race well. You made an eternal difference in this world because you followed Jesus. And I'm hoping Jesus just kind of lets me stand beside him as you guys come up and Eyes wide open as you can't believe what God has in store for you. And each one of you receive his approval because you lived your life in a serious way for Jesus Christ. That's my prayer for you. Now, I want you guys to know, a lot of you have asked, um, hey, you're retiring. That mean the golf course? I don't know. Like, I, I just... Something I pulled behind the truck and sit in a KOA camp just doesn't, like, I I know that's really good, but it's not me. So um, I want to tell you guys what we're going to do. I'll give you a quick snapshot. I'm going to invite Cindy up um, as I share it with you. And so here's what we're going to be doing um, over the next uh, 25 to 50 years, (laughs) something like that. (laughs) That's the plan. So, three major focus areas. The first one's Christ Together Greater Austin. I actually put the websites up here. If you guys are curious about what these things are, go look at them. Um, We're deeply invested in Austin, and we plan to continue. Part of my passion is to make sure the next generation of pastors coming up have a heart for this city. And we connect them not only to each other, but to the key leaders in our city so we can continue the transformational work that we've been doing and actually see every man, woman, and child have a repeated opportunity to see, hear, and respond to the gospel 
because they're connected to somebody who cares. Second thing is national. So I'm also on the board of Christ Together National. It's a ministry that we participated in starting in, in 2013. And right now we're working in 100 cities to bring pastors and leaders together to saturate those cities with the gospel. And, and I'm going to be on the road doing some traveling to cities. In fact, I've got a, a trip to Milwaukee in February where I'm going to be going and meeting with leaders and pastors there to help them catch the vision that we've had in Austin. So I'll be doing some of that. And here's the last part. We're going to join the board, the board of VIA Nations. It's an international mission board, and the name VIA means through, through the nations. In other words, how do we reach the parts of the world that have not been touched with the gospel yet, not just by sending Americans, by helping countries, the nations send people from their countries as well. And so um, we're having a final call with their board tonight, and our plan is to join that board. So I'll be doing some international traveling, uh, speaking, teaching, strategizing, and doing those things. And, and one of the reasons why this is so important is a number of years ago, um, President George W. Bush came, uh, this was after he was out of office, came to one of our missions gatherings, and he made some interesting statements in that. He said, he had dedicated his life and his presidency to try to bring democracy to nations in the world that were ruled by tyrannical dictators. But after eight years of trying to do that from the president of the United States, he realized that there would never be democracy coming to a country if the gospel didn't get there first. Because he said... He believed if people had not experienced the transformational power of seeing their brothers, sisters, neighbors as people created in the image of God and worthy of salvation, if that was not present in a culture, there would never be a chance for democracy to invade a country or become part of a country. And so we believe that being part of taking the gospel to the nations is populating heaven with followers of Jesus and transforming the world. And so um, those are things we're going to be involved in. We also have a lot of side projects, so courageous parenting. We've got a fourth quarter ministry in our heads. We've got a lot of things <laughs> that are rolling around in here that we're not sure what to do with them all, but we're going to do something. So um, th these are the main things right here. There will be focused on so you guys can see I'm going to be on the road some, and then um, we got a lot of other things too, so we'll keep you posted as we go along. But I, I really want you to hear from Cindy. <laughs> hey, well done. Well done. Thank you. And well done to you. Mm -hmm. It's It's been a honor to be on this journey with you and I know our kids feel the same way and our grandkids will too. Yeah, they will. They will. When Gigi gets a hold of them, they will. <laughs> um, before I talk to y'all specifically, I just want to thank God for placing us in this family called Hill Country Bible Church. You know, when we came 35 years ago and joined the 180 people, men, women, children, um, we had no idea what we were in for over there behind the Dairy Queen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we knew that God was good, and we knew that he loved people and pursued people. And what we came to know quickly was that Hill Country, the people of Hill Country, love God and love people. Mm -hmm. And not as a side gig, but as a full-time life purpose gig. And so that set us on a trajectory that we could never have imagined. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank God for that because it has just been an honor um, to be part of you. And um, I also want to thank you, the people of Hill Country. Just thank you for doing this together with us. Mm -hmm. Thank you first for loving our family. You've loved us so well. You know, from a from a mom's perspective, those of you who are moms, but also dads, mm -hmm. <laughs> but the way to bond with a mom is to love her kids. Mm -hmm. And you have loved my kids. 
You know, they had the privilege of growing up in a church that wasn't picking them apart, but that was pulling for them. And that was a huge gift. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Thank you you for welcoming, welcoming us in as one of you. We've never since the beginning felt other. We've always just been a part of the family. Mm-hmm. And you cared for us just like you care for each other. We've always just been one of you. You've carried us through a lot of highs and lows and really practical things, not because we were special, because that's, that's what you do for each other. So I actually made a list of some of those practical things that you have uh, cared for us in, uh, you've p- unpacked our house three times. <laughs> you fixed our cars, our toilets, our floors, our roof, and many other things that we had no ability to do. Um, you've given us financial advice, tax advice, tech advice, medical advice. You've, with our kids, you babysat our kids. You've helped our kids with their school projects because I just can't. Um, you've coached them, you've encouraged them, you've invested in them, you helped them prep for college, you helped them get jobs. Um, For us, you've cooked for us, you've cooked for our neighbors, you've tried to teach me how to cook. Um, There have been some interventions in a very positive way, like they were well needed, but interventions with our dress, um, (laughs) with our furniture, with our decor. We uh, deeply appreciate that. You've rushed us to the hospital. You've sat with us in waiting rooms. You've been with us in the hospital rooms. We thank you for that. Um, We've laughed a whole lot. We've prayed a whole lot. We've enjoyed so much life with you, so thank you for that. Uh, Third, I wanna thank y'all for following Jesus. I'm amazed at how you've pushed yourselves to know and love and become like Jesus, and in pushing yourselves, you've pushed us, and sometimes y'all have gotten real pushy, (laughs) but but we're better for it. Mm -hmm. And lastly, I wanna thank you, and this is probably the thing I'm most thankful for, Thank you for um, partnering with us in the gospel. We love how you love people. We love how you love your neighbors and your coworkers and your family and your friends. And you love them when they're happy and you love them when they're hurting. And you love them when they're the same as you and you love them when they're very different. And We love that when we introduce you to our people, to our friends and family and coworkers and neighbors, that you love them because you want them to know and experience the joy and the life that's in Jesus. Mm -hmm. You see them through God's eyes. Mm -hmm. And so we're just so thankful for that. And and it's been such a joy. Mm -hmm. Um, When Paul wrote the Philippians and said, I pray, when I pray with you, I always pray for joy because you've been partners in the gospel from the first day until now. Mm -hmm. And that's been so true. Mm -hmm. And he wrote the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians, and he said, you know, who is my joy when I stand before Jesus? You. You are my joy. Mm -hmm. Y'all are our joy. You've been an absolute joy. Thank you for that. And I I just want to add, um, from the first Friday that we arrived, um, I was with a group of leaders praying on our knees for this church, and I've been on my knees uh, praying for this church all the way up until the end of August, when I handed that responsibility over to Tim. And uh, that time of having a group of guys praying every week on our knees for your sanctification, for your growth, laid the foundation for me to grow spiritually and for our church. And the other thing is, is you you all have just been crazy enough to try some of these visionary things that we threw out there. And so when I tell other pastors, well, Hill Country Bible Church has planted 41 churches 
they're like, are you, are you guys meeting in a shed with three people? Because that means you're sending out hundreds of people and your key leaders and your staff and your money is going out the door. That must mean like what you have left. And I just want you to look around. Like what we have left is the rest of us. So, I mean, God has been working um, through crazy things. When we started church planning ministries in East Asia and Central Asia, uh, I mean, just when we said, we're going to try to reach every major city in the United States, and everybody was like, oh, yeah, let's do it. I'm like, y'all sure? <laughs> okay, let's do it. So you, you've just been people that are courageously confident that when God calls, that he's going to do something, and all we have to do is say yes, and that has given breath to me as a pastor, and I'm just so grateful for you. And, and, and I want to pray a benediction over you, um, and we're not completely done yet, but I, I want to pray this prayer over you, so let, let me pray for you. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to bring you whole, complete, into his presence at his coming. May you fill each person with joy and confidence and courage to take on this journey of life that's marked out for them and to walk with you until we stand in your presence. I pray this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.